All right, this is Drama 203, Section 1, Lecture 6. And today I'm going to be talking about the theater of ancient Rome. But before I get into the Romans, I want to say a few things about the legacy of 5th century BCE Athenian drama, the drama that we've been studying these last four weeks. By the middle of the 5th century, Athenian tragedy and comedy were spreading throughout Greece. At first, there were local re-performances of the plays in the Dems of Attica, the Dems, the provinces of Attica, of which Athens was the capital. Visitors from other parts of Greece began to show an interest in staging plays by Athenians. The kingdom of Syracuse, which was located in Sicily, uh, had erected a large theater in the middle of the 5th century, and the king of Syracuse invited Aeschylus to stage one of his plays in that theater. By the start of the 4th century, each of the major cities in Greece had its own theater. It was in the 4th century that the theater of Epidaurus was built. We looked at the ruins of that theater in the first lecture of this class. Meanwhile, more cities in southern Italy were staging comedies and tragedies. The historian Mark Griffith writes the following about Greek theater in the 4th century BCE. Traveling groups of actors could find support for festival performances and collaborations of various kinds. On a more domestic scale, well-educated elites would read plays at home and their children would read the classics in school. Dinner parties might be the occasion for reading and enactments of selected plays performed by hired professionals, and budding orators would train their voices and gestural techniques by studying with actors. Athens had been defeated by Sparta in 404 BCE, ending the Peloponnesian War. I talked a great deal about the Peloponnesian War in the last lecture when I went over Aristophanes' great work, the anti-war comedy Lysistrata. Well, Athens lost that war, and in doing so, Athens lost its empire. Eventually, Athens lost its democracy. However, in the century that followed, the 4th century BCE, the drama that had originated in democratic Athens became the most popular performing art in the Mediterranean nations. We go back a moment to the fifth century and Aeschylus. When Aeschylus died in 456 BCE, the Athenians passed a resolution. The resolution read that Aeschylus's plays could be restaged at the City Dionysia Festival rather than newly written works. Well, throughout the fourth century, the works of Aeschylus, as well as the works of Sophocles and Euripides, were regularly revived for the stage. In the 330s, Lysurgis. Lysurgis was this very powerful politician in Athens. He was, he was Athens' manager of public revenue. And he commissioned authoritative copies for the state archives of the surviving texts of these three great tragic playwrights. Lysurgis also had the Dionysian theater renovated. Just outside the theater, he commissioned the creation of three bronze statues representing the three great playwrights. There were new Greek tragedies and comedies, likely hundreds of them, written during the fourth century, but only two survived. The final two plays of Aristophanes. Aristophanes dies. Some scholars put his date of death at 388, others at 385. His last two plays, The Women in Assembly, which was a bit like Lysistrata. I don't think it's quite as good as Lysistrata. And Wealth, which I think is a very underrated play in Aristophanes' canon. Well, those were his last two plays, and those are the only two plays that survived from this entire century, the fourth century BCE. The city Dionysia festival of Athens would continue 
It would continue for another two centuries, finally coming to an end in the mid-2nd century BCE. Well, as Athens and its longtime enemy, Sparta, declined politically, economically, and militarily, another city-state gained prominence, Rome, a city in the province of Latium in central Italy. Rome was established on the Tiber River sometime in the 8th century BCE. According to legend, you've probably heard this story, it was founded by the brothers Romulus and Remus. The Etruscans, the Etruscans who were a people from present-day Tuscany and Umbria, conquered Rome around 750 BCE. They built roads, temples, public buildings. And under the Etruscans, Rome grew from a village of farmers and shepherds into a wealthy city, a city of trade and commerce and culture. In 509 BCE, a war broke out in Rome, and the Romans successfully rebelled against the last Etruscan king, King Tarquin. The victorious Romans founded a republic. The Republic was governed by the Roman Senate, led by two consuls, each of whom was elected for a one-year term. The Senate and the consulships were dominated by Rome's wealthy land-owning citizens called patricians. The common people were called plebeians. The plebeians slowly but surely over the 5th and 4th centuries gained more political and legal rights, eventually receiving their own citizen assembly. In a series of wars fought in the 3rd century BCE, Rome unified all of Italy under its control. In that century, Rome also expanded its conquest to present-day Spain and North Africa. Uh, they conquered North Africa in a series of wars called the Punic Wars. And this is where the uh, Carthaginian general Hannibal uh, becomes uh, the great enemy of Rome. Well, Rome won those battles in the end. And by 146 BCE, Rome had taken control of Greece as well. Well, while there is some evidence that the Etruscans, the Etruscans, staged choral performances, and possibly even satyr plays, it was during the era of the Roman Republic that a distinctive Roman theater emerged. In the 6th century BCE, Rome began holding its annual festival. This was called the Ludi Romani, the Roman Games. The Ludi Romani took place in September to honor the god Jupiter, uh, the head of the Olympians. It was the Roman name for Zeus. By 364 BCE, theatrical entertainments, ludi skenini, stage games, were part of the ludi celebration, along with acrobats, jugglers, and dancers. In 240, an immigrant to Rome who had come from southern Italy and who was possibly a former slave named Livius Andronicus translated a Greek comedy, we don't know which Greek comedy, into Latin and staged that play at the Ludi. Andronicus wrote, directed, and starred in a number of tragedies as well, which, like his comedies, were apparently based on Greek originals. The Roman Senate soon recognized the Collegium Paraterum, essentially a trade union of professional playwrights and actors. Other Roman playwrights received support from wealthy patricians. The actors of the Roman theater, it's important to note, were all professionals. There were no talented amateurs, as there had been in the Greek choruses at the City Dionysia and the Linnea festivals. 
The adaptations of Greek plays by Livius Andronicus and his colleagues minimized the chorus and in many cases eliminated the chorus altogether. By the first century BCE, there were five more Ludi festivals that included dramatic performances. Each festival lasted six to seven days. Theatrical performances in Rome originally took place on temporary stages, wooden structures that were put up for a festival and then dismantled. These temporary stages were backed by a scene building that usually had three doors, which would be incorporated into the plays. And in the email that I will soon send you, I will include an image of uh, a, a, a reconstruction by scholars of how they believe these temporary uh, uh, stages, uh, what, what these temporary stages looked like that were used by the earliest uh, directors, producers, and actors of Roman theater. Well, in 55 BCE, we have Pompey. Pompey was this powerful general and consul who at times attempted to be the dictator of Rome, defeated many of Rome's greatest enemies. Uh, he commissioned the construction of Rome's first permanent stone theater. He named it after himself, the Theater of Pompeii, and it adjoined the Temple of Venus. Two more stone theaters were soon built in Rome. In the decades that followed, more theaters were constructed in the territories and provinces under Roman control. The Roman theaters, and again, I'm going to send you an image where scholars drawing upon the existing documents and, and illustrations uh, have reconstructed what uh, a Roman theater would have looked like. Well, these Roman theaters were modeled on those of the Greeks open-air amphitheaters of up to 20,000 seats. The space for the audience was a vast semicircle. The Greeks call it the theatron. The Romans call it the cavea, the auditorium. Some Roman theaters were built into hills, as the Greek theaters had been, but most were built on flat land. They were freestanding structures. Now, here's an important difference between Greek and Roman theaters. In contrast to the Greek theaters, Roman theaters had a wooden raised stage, the pulpitum, the pulpitum, a stage of various heights at different times over the course of drama as it existed in the Roman Republic. A roof covered the pulpitum, covered the stage. And in the more elaborate Roman theaters, there were trap doors and sliding panels, even elevators, which lifted actors onto the stage. The Roman theaters had a scheme, a scene building at the back of the stage. The Romans called it the scena, as opposed to the scheme, which is the name the Greeks gave the scene building. Unlike the Greek scheme, the Roman scena was several stories high. The Romans also introduced the stage curtain. This is where the stage curtain begins. They called it the ilium. It was lowered into a slot in the floor or raised above the stage with ropes. This is where the stage curtain is originated. Well, the actors in Roman theater continued to wear masks in performances, just as the Greek actors had done in previous centuries. Based on the limited evidence we have, the tragic mask seems to have become more stylized in the Roman theater, whereas the comic mask became more realistic. The actors wore high boots with raised toes. You've probably seen these images uh, depicted in illustrations from time to time. When it comes to acting in the Roman theater, the emphasis was on stage presence and vocal delivery. 
the choreographed movements of 5th century Athenian theater were no longer part of the actor's repertoire. The audience for theater in Rome consisted of every social class from the patricians, the senators, all the way down to the slaves. Admission was free, although seating was reserved for the wealthy. Senators and their families often sat in the orchestra, which was a semicircle in Roman theaters. Remember, it was a circle in the uh, Dionysian theater in Athens. The orchestra could also sometimes be used for staging fights and, and battles that were part of the tragedy being presented on the pulpitum. Well, there were other immensely popular forms of entertainment presented at the Roman Ludi. One was pantomime. Pantomime, an interpretive dance performed by a mute male soloist who wore a mask and was accompanied by a small orchestra. The dancer would act out a mythological story. The pantomime was derived from the folk traditions of Italy and it first became part of the Ludi in the third century. The pantomime was without a doubt one of the most popular forms of entertainment all through this period that I'm going to be discussing. The Roman Republic and even into the Roman Empire, which I'll get into later. There were still more entertainment spectacles at the Ludi, at the games, including boxing, wrestling, chariot races, horse racing, animal blood sports, and most famously, the gladiatorial games, one-on-one -on -one combat to the death. The first of the gladiatorial games took place in 264 BCE. Sometimes they even pitted animals against men and women, and it was a bloody, gory business. Well, to understand the work of the two most famous playwrights of the Roman Republic, we must go back to the Greeks. Scholars distinguish between two types of ancient comic drama, old comedy and new comedy. Old comedy combines biting political and social satire, coarse humor, bodiness, and outrageous fantasy. As I explained last week, the 11 surviving plays of Aristophanes are the only examples we have of this comic form. Aristophanes, the master, considered in his own time, the master of what came to be called old comedy. New comedy emerged in Athens in the late 4th century BCE. Its creator was Menander. Menander lived between 342 and 292. He is said to have written 108 comedies. Except for Menander's Descalus, meaning the grouch, and fragments of several of his other plays, all of Greek new comedy was lost during the medieval period. We have only the one complete play, the Grouch, Discalus, and as I say, fragments from other plays. We have enough of Menander's work and commentaries about that work to know that his plays deal with the domestic affairs of middle-class Athenians. New comedy focuses on families, usually more than one family, two households. Generational conflict is one of the main themes of new comedy. This play, the only surviving play, complete play by Menander, The Grouch, has a scenario that is common in new comedy. Young lovers kept apart by a tyrannical father. It goes back to Menander. He was the first playwright that we know of to write stories with that you know, very common scenario. I should note that in significant ways, Greek new comedy is far removed from modern romantic comedy. The female lover 
in 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 Greek New Comedy, in the Grouch, she's simply known as Girl, is given almost no characterization and very few lines. So for me, I finally read this play by Menander, the Grouch, this, this play that influenced New Comedy, which led to so many things uh, in the centuries that followed. And it was a bit of a disappointment. It, 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 it sort of reminded me of a mediocre Seinfeld episode. Uh, but the influence of Menander cannot be uh, overemphasized. He was one of the single most influential playwrights uh, in the whole Western tradition because he invented new comedy. Disguise, trickery, miscommunication, and coincidence are among the hallmarks of new comedy. The sittings of these plays are urban. They take place on city streets with the skeena meant to represent the fronts of houses. New comedy features type characters. You're not going to get a lot of uh, character death in a Greek new comedy. Uh, type characters. I'm going to use this term uh, many times in the upcoming lectures. Type characters, which means characters built around a single idea or quality, a type character. Some of the more uh, famous and, and more recurring type characters in new comedy are the clever slave, the parasite, also known as the sponge, the gluttonous, scheming flatterer who lives off a wealthy friend, the villainous pimp, the cunning prostitute, the angry father, the persecuted young woman, the boastful soldier, all recurring type characters in new comedy. In Greek New Comedy, the chorus no longer shared a stage with the actors. The chorus was reduced to doing musical numbers between scenes. Unquestionably, compared to old comedy, New Comedy is far less overtly political or topical. Edith Hall, I've quoted her in previous lectures, uh, Edith Hall says this, of new comedy. It's a form of comedy that suits a state that isn't democratic anymore. And indeed, Menander invented new comedy at a time when Athens had lost its democracy. There was no way an Aristophanes could have uh, uh, staged the plays that he did in democratic Athens uh, uh, in, in the time of Menander. It just wouldn't have been possible. There, it, was a, it was an authoritarian government. And so we have Greek new comedy, which in some ways uh, resembles uh, modern day sitcoms and sketch comedy. Uh, comedy built around misunderstanding, coincidence, mistaken identity, and, uh, and families, family conflict. Well, the Roman playwrights Plautus and Terence adapted Greek new comedies into Latin, the language used in the Roman Empire. Plautus lived between 254 and 184 BCE, and Terence lived between 195 and 159 BCE. They adapted not only Menander's comedies, but also now lost comedies by Menander's Greek contemporaries. Plautus and Terence retained the Greek sittings of the original. So that's how we can say some authoritative things about these Greek comedies. We only have one Greek comedy uh, that's complete, Menander's the Grouch, but we have all these adaptations of Greek new comedy, adaptations done by the Roman playwrights, Plautus and Terence. 21 of Plautus's comedies survive and six of Terence's. The degree to which these plays alter the Greek originals is, in the words of scholar Richard Beecham, a subject of endless scholarly debate. A majority of scholars agree that in adapting Menander, Plautus added to the Greek play elements of what is called a Tillin farce. A Tillin farce is a comic skit 
involving two or three over-the-top buffoonish characters. The Attilan farce takes its name from the town of Attila, which is near Naples. Attilan farces were sometimes scripted, but most often improvised. Plautus apparently performed in these Attilan farces early in his career. Well, let's uh, look at these two writers a bit more, Terence and Plautus, the two writers who brought Greek new comedy to the Roman stage. Terence was highly regarded in his time. His patron was the powerful general Scipio the Younger, who had defeated Hannibal. But it was the fast-paced, joke-filled, linguistically rich comedies of Plautus that achieved mass popularity in the Roman world. Here's my edition of Plautus. I sort of hold near and dear to my heart because when I studied Latin and, and learned somewhat the Latin language, I did so by translating the works of Plautus. Plautus's work continued to be performed on Roman stages for several centuries after his death. In the first century BCE, the scholar Marcus Varro collected together the scripts of 20 of Plautus's 21 surviving plays. It's said that Plautus actually wrote over 100 plays. We only have 21 of them. I'll discuss new comedy again in upcoming weeks when we look at Shakespeare's Twelfth Night and Molière's Tartuffe. For now, I want to turn to Seneca. Seneca and the Rome in which he wrote his plays, not the Roman Republic, but the Roman Empire. We have the names of successful tragic playwrights of the Republic. Asivius is one of them, Quintus Ennius is another, but none of their works survives. We do have the nine tragedies written by the first century CE, meaning Common Era, playwright, philosopher, and statesman, Lucius Aeneas Seneca, who was born in 4 BCE, died in 65 CE. Seneca, as I just mentioned, wrote at the time of the Roman Empire. In the first century BCE, there were a series of civil wars within the Roman Republic. From 49 to 45 BCE, the forces of Pompey, remember the, uh, the man who commissioned the building of the Theater of Pompey, the first freestanding theater in Rome. Well, his uh, allies and his, and his forces uh, did battle with that of another powerful general, Julius Caesar. They battled for control of Rome. Caesar won, but in, 440, in 44 BCE, a group of patricians, Caesar's apparent allies, assassinated him. This led to renewed civil war, actually five civil wars. And this is where uh, historical figures such as Mark Anthony and Cassius, uh, Cleopatra, uh, they, Brutus, they all become involved in this story, the civil wars of the first century BCE that nearly destroyed Rome. Well, by 27 BCE, Julius Caesar's adopted son, Octavian, had defeated all his rivals, and he renamed himself Augustus. He called himself the Precepts, the first citizen of Rome, but in fact, he was the first Roman emperor. The Senate still functioned, but the emperor controlled it. The emperor controlled the Senate, as well as the army, and all the Roman provinces. The Roman Republic was dead. Augustus died in 14 CE, and by the time Seneca began his political career, Tiberius, Augustus's stepson, was emperor. Seneca became a famous orator and writer. Uh, he, he was known for giving these impassioned speeches 
in the Roman Senate. Uh, Seneca's own father had been a very uh, uh, powerful and, and well-known politician. Seneca had his misfortunes as well very early in his career. He was exiled by one emperor, Emperor Claudius, but later brought back to Rome to tutor a future emperor, Nero. Once Nero succeeded Claudius as emperor, Seneca served as Nero's speechwriter. But in 65 CE, Seneca was accused of being part of a conspiracy to assassinate Nero. And as punishment, he was forced to commit suicide. Well, Seneca was known in his own time primarily as a, as, as a statesman, a speechwriter, in some respects a propagandist for Nero, who eventually turned on him. Uh, but it, 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 as a historical figure, I think we know him best as uh, first a writer, a, a writer on philosophy. Uh, Seneca was an influential advocate of the philosophical doctrine known as Stoicism, which became very prominent in the Roman Republic and in the Roman Empire. Seneca is the author of the Moral Epistles. It's sometimes referred to as Letters from a Stoic. It's still a fairly widely read book. I saw some articles on it uh, only a few months ago that uh, Seneca has been rediscovered, his philosophical works. Well, what interests us most in, in Drama 203 is Seneca's tragedies. Uh, since the late 19th century, most scholars have argued that Seneca's plays are what are called closet dramas. Closet meaning they were never meant to be performed. Instead, they were recited in public gatherings. Recent scholarship uh, has gone in the other direction. Recent scholarship has suggested it's quite possible, maybe, in, maybe even likely, that the plays were performed at the emperor's court. And here's my edition, the latest uh, Oxford edition of Seneca, six of his tragedies, six of the nine tragedies that uh, were preserved. Uh, what can I say about these tragedies? Well, first important point, Seneca's tragedies adapt the works of Sophocles and Euripides. However, there are significant differences. Significant differences between the source material and Seneca's reworkings. The role of the chorus is minimized in Seneca. There is far less emphasis on the gods. Most notably, most of the violence reported by messengers in Greek tragedy, in Aeschylus, in Sophocles, is depicted by Seneca in all its gore. Emily Watson, who was the translator, who translated this wonderful Oxford edition, uh, has written this of Seneca. She says, Seneca's tragedies are intense. They show us people who push themselves too far beyond the limits of ordinary behavior and emotion. Passion is constantly set against reason, and passion wins out. Excess is Seneca's subject, as well as the primary characteristic of his style. And that is very well put, because the violence in these plays is intense. The speeches, there's these long, uh, 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 richly metaphorical speeches uh, that uh, have both in, in, impressed uh, readers over the centuries and left some wondering why Seneca was ever considered a good writer. Well, I'll be returning to Seneca. I'll be returning to Seneca when we begin our study of early modern tragedy because Seneca, uh, his works left their imprint on the works of Christopher Marlowe, William Shakespeare, and a great many of the dramatists who followed them. Well, Roman theater continued for over five centuries following Seneca, but we have no play texts from those five centuries. 
It seems that drama came to be overshadowed by the non-dramatic entertainments at the Ludi, especially the gruesome blood sports. And then in 312, in 312 CE, the Common Era, the Roman Emperor Constantine converted to Christianity and made Christianity the state religion. The early Christian church was a staunch enemy of the theater. By 398 CE, the church decreed excommunication for anyone going to the theater or the games on holy days. Actors were denied the holy sacraments. Even as the Christian church criticized the theater, the Roman Empire, over the course of the 4th and 5th centuries, suffered near total political and economic collapse. The Western Empire, which was centered in the city of Rome, fell in 476 to Germanic invaders. The last recorded performance in a Roman theater was 533 CE. And in 692, the Trullan Council, which was a church council held in Constantinople, banned all forms of theatrical performance. And so ends, for at least 500 years, uh, theater in the Western world. And so ends that uh, legacy that begins in the 600 BCE uh, with the Dionysian theater and the founding of the Dionysian festival to uh, the performances and restagings and reworkings of those play by Seneca and the dramatist that we assume followed Seneca uh, in the final centuries of the Roman Empire. So that's my lecture on ancient Roman theater. Next day, we'll be looking at medieval theater and in particular, what are called the mystery plays, sometimes called biblical plays or pageant plays. And one such play in particular that I absolutely love, the Wakefield Second Shepherd's Play. So if you all read that play in the Nordic Anthology of Drama, and uh, we'll be discussing it very soon.